This is a, a talk hosted by the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Um, and uh, I'm Tomaso Poggio. I'm very glad to welcome Misha Belkin here. Misha was a student of a student of mine, Partha Nioji, was Parta was one of the purest intellects that I met in my life. And uh, Misha worked with uh, Parta on uh, um, Laplacian eigenmaps and uh, semi-supervised learning, something that has, uh, is still uh, a milestone in uh, modern machine learning. And um, Misha has always been um, extremely reliable, something, somebody you can believe in all the formal details of proving something rightly. And uh, um, I think today, for the first time, you will speak about something which is a bit more crazy. And I'm not sure I'll believe it, but uh, we'll see. Oh, thank you, Tommy. Uh, <laughs> I hope not too crazy. Uh, anyway, I, I'll that's try to moderate. <laughs> I'll moderate the craziness level, uh, maybe. Uh, OK, so um, what I would like to talk about, the, the title of the talk is Fit Without Fear. And this is actually kind of a technical description of what we do in machine learning now. I'll explain this in a minute. But uh, meanwhile, this is, this is based on uh, joint work with um, collaborators, my students, Siyuan Ma, Sumik Mandel, Li Kehuei, and Si Yuan in particular had done an amazing job on this. And also um, my colleagues, uh, Rev Basile Tehaste, Daniel Suet Kalambe, and Parta Mitre and Spring Harbor Labs. Uh, OK. Uh, so, well, we all um, know that machine learning AI is becoming really a backbone of commerce and society. And this is changing the way we do a lot of things both in commercial application and science, and uh, all kinds of domains. Then what, 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 what is behind it? Well, if you look at um, a typical architecture for, say, a vision problem, you have something like that. This is Google Net from 2014. This is a network with uh, about 5 million parameters. And uh, as you can see from the picture, this is a very complex object. So, at this point, we have this object which are kind of running our inferential tasks. But we don't necessarily understand what this project do as well as we would like to. And there is a little bit of, uh, well, fog of war, if you wish, is that there is a lot of excitement about it and a lot of success. But we need to actually, from a scientific point of view, we have to gain better understanding of what they do, what are the key aspects. We have to isolate and analyze components of how this method or other methods work. Um, let me very briefly to uh, state the problem of supervised machine learning, just to make sure we're on the same page. I'm sure everybody knows it. Basically, you have data x, i, y, i. x, i's are point in some d-dimensional space. These are features, say pixel values of images. And y, i's are, for simplicity, I'm just taking them to be binary, minus one and one values. But they can be multi-class. In most practical tasks, they're multi-class. The goal now of machine learning is to construct a function, given this data, to construct a function from the feature space to R, or to minus 1, 1 more specifically, that generalizes to unseen data. Well, it's kind of an interesting question. What does it mean to generalize? But in many um, sort of uh, theoretical, at least, analysis, what we mean by that is that we have some probability distribution for the data. And what we observe uh, on the data which we haven't seen should somehow be reasonable, be reasonably good. It should basically perform well. Uh, now, how is it done? Well, the typical algorithm for this is empirical risk minimization. Well, strictly speaking, this is not an algorithm, but algorithms are based on that. You take a class of functions, f, and this f may be neural networks, for example, and I'll talk particularly about one class of kernel architectures, and you minimize the loss function over that class of functions. And f star, in this case, is simply 
the function from this class which minimizes the loss, and by the loss here, this may be a classification loss or say regression loss like the square loss. Now, there are a lot of theoretical analysis based on the complexity of H, in particular some you know, common analysis are based on VC dimension, VC, th VC theory, uh, things like Rademacher complexity and so on. And many of this analysis result in generalization bounds of this form. You basically look at the expected value of F star, this is the prediction on the future data, and you say that the prediction on the future data, this is generalization, is not much worse than prediction on the test, on the train data plus some term, uh, sorry, uh, which is roughly one over square root of n. So when n is large, these two should be close. That's basically the upshot. There are other analysis too, I'll maybe say something about this. Um, okay, so that's, uh, now I will talk quite a bit about interpolation and overfitting in this talk. So what is interpolation? Interpolation is the following. So this is just a cartoon of my data. My feature here is one dimensional and the label is one or minus one. Interpolation is simply classical interpolation. I say that a function interpolates my data if f of xi is equal to yi. Overfitting is very similar except I'm kind of interpolating the sign. So overfitting to me is f of xi is a sign is equal to yi. You can view it as zero loss fitting if you don't like the term overfitting. You, um, overfitting has some sort of negative connotation. I, um, in this case, I'm just using it as a purely technical term. There is nothing negative, negative or positive about that for me in the context of this talk. Okay, so that's zero loss fitting or overfitting, interpolation, that's what they are. Now, uh, what, what about modern machine learning? Well, one very important feature of modern machine learning is massive overparameterization. And I, I would argue that it's actually a, an innovation. Why, why is this an innovation? Well, it's not strictly speaking new, but it's kind of new. So let, let me be first uh, tell you what is overparameterization. Overparameterization is simply when the number of parameters is larger or equal, actually, but in practice, it's often much larger than the number of training data. And if you look at this nice diagram of various architectures from uh, Kanziani et al., uh, you see that uh, the, si the circles here correspond to different neural net architectures. The size of the circle is how many parameters it has. So Google Net, which I show you on the first one, has about 5 million parameters. The big ones have about 150 million parameters. Now you have 150 million parameters, you are training this on, uh, you know, maybe 10, 100, or even a million data points, you have many, many more parameters than data points. So that's our parameterization. Now, uh, what's the uh, upshot? Why is our parameterization important? Well, let's look at this uh, table, and this table is from Understanding Deep Learning requires rethinking generalization from Jean et al. 2017. They uh, give an example. They train uh, using, uh, this is I think trained on a data set CIFAR, which is I think it has about 50,000 data points. They use this inception model, which is a type of neural network. It has 1.5 million parameters, so many more parameters are data points. And they get train accuracy of 100%. Now, 100%, maybe this, this could be kind of viewed as surprising. Well, how do you get train accuracy of 100%? So they overfit the data using, you know, the notation of the stock. They have zero loss. Uh, perhaps this is surprising, right? Because we know that neural network is some sort of non-convex, complex architecture. Why can optimization actually get us to zero loss on this non-convex uh, problem? In general, those are hard to optimize. And there have been quite a lot of work showing that all local minima of such networks are global. But perhaps once you think from the overparameterization point of view, this is not too surprising. Your parameters are variables and the data points are constraints. If the number of variables is much larger than the number of constraints, you usually can solve the system of equations. I mean, this, of course, is not always true, but generically there is some sort of mathematical quote-unquote theorem saying that those things are solvable. So it's not surprising that we can actually get to zero loss if we have so many parameters. Of course, we cannot get below zero loss because 
the way we construct the loss function is always positive. So that's a constraint. So perhaps it's not too surprising that all local minima are global. Of course, you have to still prove this in particular cases. Uh, the kind of more important thing is that overparameterization leads to overfitting, pretty easy, relatively speaking, overfitting and interpolation. Because your optimization just goes down to uh, zero loss. Now, uh, perhaps a more surprising aspect of this table is the following. You uh, train to have 0% loss, so 100% accuracy, yet your test performance is still very good. It's about 90, just under 90%. So how come that you are not overfitting in the bad sense? Even though you have this overfitting, you have zero loss, but you are still performing very well. Why is it that you're getting good results? And in fact, um, there is a nice quote from uh, Ruslan Salakuddin of uh, Simon's tutorial. He gave it to, he is a well-known expert on neural networks. He gave a tutorial at the Simon's Institute last year in uh, Berkeley. He said um, the following, this is actually a quote. Basically, you want to make sure you hit the zero training error. Because if you don't, you somehow waste the capacity of the model. So I was actually in the audience and it really struck me as something very um, surprising because, you know, we tell our students not to do this when we teach machine learning. Uh, this is uh, just saying that there is no penalty effectively for fitting the data exactly. And this is somehow when you train these deep networks, this is somehow the best practice according to Ruslan. Uh, so let, let, me, let me give an overview of this talk. So first, um, the first point I would like to make is that this very strong overfitted performance is not really special to deep network. And what I'm going to show is that classical kernels have something very, very similar to this, the classical kernel machines. And uh, in fact, we can basically observe it in exactly the same form. That's one. Second, is that overfitting is actually hard in the following sense, that to be able to fit with zero error is a non-trivial optimization problem for large data. And in some sense, once you make this happen, once you have some sort of good method for dealing with large data, the performance of kernels becomes competitive with neural nets, at least for problems which are not convolutional in the structure. Like for images, you need some sort of convolutional features. But for many other things, it seems it becomes very competitive, or maybe better. Uh, so that's the role of depth of overfitting. Uh, now, the power of overfitting, it can be shown mathematically that if you are in the overfitted, or more precisely in the interpolated regime, stochastic gradient descent becomes extremely efficient computationally. And in fact, you get a very large benefit from being able to run it, and in particular, it's a very good fit to GPUs, and I'll, I'll discuss that. Uh, so that's why optimization works as well, or at least that's kind of an explanation for, we believe that, why neural networks are optimized so efficiently. And finally, I'll discuss the challenge of overfitting. And really, there is not so much help from current theory, with some exceptions, but very little. So I would, moving forward, I would present some sort of analysis of an algorithm which is nearly base optimal and can interpolate the data. So at the very least, we can show that this is not so crazy maybe to overfit as sort of traditionally thought. Okay, now uh, let me very briefly describe kernel machines. So kernel machines is uh, you know, a one slide introduction to kernel machines. Uh, kernel machines, basically you do empirical risk minimization over a space of functions which are linear combinations of kernels of this form, or this is there are other ones as well, but this is a Gaussian which is by far the most common in practice. Uh, what you have, you can show that if you optimize this, 
your solution has the following form. It's just a sum of your kernel on your data point. So basically, your classifier is a sum of Gaussians on your data point. It's a Gaussian mixture, if you wish. Uh, for the Gaussian kernel, we'll use another kernel as well. And typically, this is done using um, a regularization term, and this is uh, called Tikhonov regularization, um, which of the form lambda norm f of h squared. If you put lambda to be zero, that forces the output of this algorithm to interpolate the data, so it will fit the data exactly. And uh, this is so-called minimum norm interpolation. And the solution to this is simply alpha is equal to k to the minus 1y, where y are labels, and alpha are the coefficients in this expansion. So you get an explicit solution for this, which is nice because you can analyze it mathematically. So th these are kernels. And for all generalization analysis, pretty much you have to assume that lambda is greater than 0. But what we do, we basically put lambda to be 0. You cannot quite put lambda to be 0, but you can take lambda to be infinitesimally small, which results in the solution. Otherwise, your solution is not well defined. Now, uh, well, there is a lot of beautiful classical mathematical and statistical theory of kernels. Reproducing kernel Hirbal spaces were introduced by um, mathematicians Aronjan, and there are splines, and more recently kernel machines, well, still 20 years ago. And why is this an attractive setting? Well, it's actually, it's convex. It is analytically tractable. And also, that you can view this, and that would require a little bit of an explanation, but you can view it as a two-layer neural net. So it's a special case of neural nets. Now, uh, let's discuss interpolation. So this is an actual data set. This is actually MNIST. Um, and what we are doing here, we are running these kernels. So I'm basically solving kernels the same way as I would solve a neural network. And how do people solve neural networks? They run stochastic gradient descent for some number of epochs. So it's exactly the same way you are running this kernel or we are running this kernel. So this is the number of epochs. And this is the result. So this line is, uh, there are two different types of kernels. You can just concentrate on the blue one. It doesn't really matter so much. Uh, what you see is that as you're running, the result improves. After one epoch, is about 1.9, and then it goes to about 1.1. Here is the interesting thing. The interpolation solution is actually this line. And as you can see, um, the, so the line really interpolates the data, meaning that f of xi is equal to yi. Exactly. Well, up to numerical precision, the error is something like 10 to the minus 26. So this fits, this dashed line fits my training data exactly. I don't train anything here. Well, I train, but I just invert this matrix. That's all I do. For smaller data set, you can just invert it. For large, of course, you cannot. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting this solution. And what I see is that my, um, as the number of epochs increases, I basically converge to the solution my performance on the test. This is not train, this is test, right? So it never goes up. So early stopping would be like regularization. So if I wanted to regularize, I would stop here. But if I regularize, I just get results which are worse. This is not completely 100% true. You can see here it dips just a tiny little bit under the dashed line, but the difference is very, very small. So if there is an effect of regularization, it must be very small. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, G sigma is chosen by some sort of validation set. But we can, we can run the same thing with sigma being twice that or one half that, and you see the same result. So the baseline decreases, so you get, instead of, say, 1.5%, you get maybe 1.8. But, but it's, sigma uh, is very small. If sigma is very small, you get one nearest neighbor classifier. But the and performance, you, there will be much worse the performance. This is far from one nearest neighbor, yeah. This is quite far from one nearest neighbor. Uh, one nearest neighbor would give you about 3%. So this, this is not, so yeah, it, it is clearly not one nearest neighbor. But I mean, okay, go on. But, but sigma is like lambda, right? No, no, sigma is not like lambda. No, lambda prevents you, no, sigma doesn't prevent you from fitting the data exactly. Lambda, uh, sigma doesn't. The uh, error here is 10 to the minus 26. So we're actually fitting the data up to numerical precision. Uh, 
Uh, uh, by the way, notice that loss function is actually irrelevant here for the interpolation, right? Because interpolation has no loss function. You're just fitting your data exactly. So interpolation um, fits the data exactly, but if you do this kind of iterative update, the loss function will change your, uh, change your path to the convergence, but it wouldn't change the actual result. Okay, now um, I'm not going to look at it to, to go over this in any detail, but basically we did it on a bunch of data sets and it always looks the same. The shape of this curve is the same in every case. Every case regularization either give you anything or give you very small, very small improvement. This are like six different real data sets. Yeah. So I solve it in two ways. One is inversion, direct inversion. The other is an iterative solution. So uh, inversion, of course, there are no epochs. But there, there are two different ways of solving this. You're showing the classification. This is classification, and this is actually regression error. You're kind of overfitting in the loss and not in classification. No, yeah. Over, in the loss, I really literally have zero. I have zero both in regression and classification. But in, classi but in classification on the test, it's you fine. But I, overfitting, I mean my overfitting, which is just means yeah, zero I lost on the test. Yes, that we don't observe. We never observe this. Uh, no, no, not to any significant effect. There is a very small effect here. That may be special to deep networks, but I would, but we'll get to that later. Because I'll, um, I think deep networks they combine a lot of different things, so it's very hard to separate those issues. So that may very well. I, I, I am totally believe that. Okay, so let me, so, okay, what's going on? Fitted and interpolation generalization is not unique to deep architectures, that's very clear. That's what people have observed with deep networks, we are observing exactly the same for kernels. Can now be examined in a convex analytical setting, that's nice, because that's actually where our mathematical tools work. Um, Two-layer neural nets, well, if we don't even understand setting for two-layer neural nets, we cannot have a full theory, well, I would argue, we cannot have a full theory for general neural nets, which are much more complex. Uh, okay, so let, let's continue. So now, uh, let me tell you why this is hard and why it takes actually some effort to scale kernel methods to large data. What is hard about it? Uh, so kernel methods, it's known, it's known, well known that they work quite well on small data, not so well on large data. What's going on? Is it something intrinsic to kernel methods or is it because we don't do something correctly? And basically, that we need to address computation here. The good thing about interpolation, it makes a goal really, really simple. We don't have regularization parameters, we have nothing. We just have this linear system of equation. We have no choice of loss function, we have no choice of regularization parameters. So we just concentrate on solving this linear system of equation as efficiently as we can. And it turns out basically we get very, very strong performance once we can solve the system well for large data. So why? Let me first point out, of course, F star is found algorithmically. For large data, we basically have to map it to GPU if uh, graph, if we can uh, if we need to get good performance. Why? Because GPU is basically a parallel machine which does matrix-matrix comp computations very efficiently. It's parallelizable matrix-matrix computation. So that limits the algorithms which are for that. Basically, any algorithm which sort of has hope of scaling to large data has to combine some number of matrix-matrix products and some limited amount of other computation. If you don't have this, you have to use CPU, and CPU is maybe 10 or 50 or some large factor time, time slower, so very difficult to get good performance. So now matrix inversion. Well, we can of course do direct inversion, the cost is n cubed, that's basically impossible for, like, if you have 10 million data points, you have 10 to 
21 fold in point separation, that's impossible. And that doesn't map onto GPU as well. Well, and I say impossible, it may be possible in some circumstances, but it's essentially, we cannot do it on our machine. Maybe on a supercomputer, I don't know. Very close to impossible. Uh, so, now, uh, what's the alternative? The alternative is doing some sort of iterative update. That's, there are other alternatives as well, but this one is you know, particularly um, inviting in a sense and also parallel to what's happening in neural networks. Is that this is a really gradient descent for solving this system. And this goes under several names. This is gradient descent, this is Richardson iteration, Land Web iteration. Uh, there is, of course, quite a bit of quite a bit of literature on this. Uh, this is no. Um, this is good because this is take only n squared per iteration, and this is easily GPU compatible. That's matrix vector multiplication, right? I am updating my sorry my matrix uh, my uh, vector of weight iteratively by multiplying it by uh, the kernel matrix K. But how many iterations do I need, right? If the number of iterations is large, this is not so useful. Well, how many iterations? Well, let's look at this function, this heavy side step function. Uh, just one dimension, you have one here and zero here, right? That's one of the simplest functions you can consider. After 100 of iteration with a Gaussian kernel, you get something like this. Okay, that's maybe not too terrible. And you have like some loss, it's like six times 10 to the minus two in the square loss. If you do one million of iterations, however, you see that nothing changes. Literally, almost nothing. You didn't even get one bit of precision here. What is going on? Why is, you know, from going from 100 to 1 million, hopefully you would see something good happen, but it doesn't. Turns out is that, uh, well, let me give you a, before I sort of have an explanation, let me give you a sort of real example of this. The same thing we can observe on some data set. This is some 10,000 uh, data point subsets of standard data sets. Basically, you can see that to get optimal performance, you need more than 10,000 iterations of gradient descent. That's bad because you are worse than cubic now. You are at cubic or worse. What is going on? Well, um, the point is, is that convergence is controlled by eigenvalues of the kernel matrix. And you can prove that eigenvalues of the kernel matrix decay nearly exponentially. And that's very bad because, well, if your eigenvalue is, con if your, how many iterations is exponential, then the fact that, you know, each iteration doesn't cost very much is not really helpful. And you can prove that the dimension of the functions reachable by those iterations is kind of polylogarithmic. So basically, this is kind of bad news if you want to use that method. At least with, this is for Gaussian kernels, I should say. So it doesn't necessarily apply to other kernels, but that's a popular type of kernel. Uh, in fact, you can prove that only very smooth functions can be epsilon approximated by a smooth kernel in some sort of polynomial number of iterations. And the problem is that we don't really expect classification functions to be smooth. Now, what's going on? Well, actually, that contradict classical rate for gradient descent. There are some classical rates, if you've seen it, which are of the form one over epsilon squared. I'm saying this is like some logarithmic thing. Why is that? Well, it has to do with infinite dimensionality. I can sort of explain it offline if you would like. But uh, that's basically an issue. Well, what do you do? How do you solve this? Well, there, are, there is a clear problem, right? The problem is that the eigenvalues decay quickly. And basically, what your convergence depends on, it depends on the ratio of eigenvalues. So a way to address this is to actually uh, flatten the spectrum of the matrix. And you can do this by constructing this kind of new kernel, if you wish. It basically, literally, maybe this is the best way to sort of explain this. You just look at the spectrum uh, eigenvalues as a function of the index, right? And you have some sort of decay like this. And what you do, you literally flatten the spectrum up to some point. So that's a modified kernel. How much performance gain do you get? You feed first E1, AK in one iteration. 
So first, k again directions you fit in one iteration, and then you get lambda one divided by lambda k plus one acceleration for each next one. And that is exponential, well, hopefully exponential. So you potentially getting exponential improvement in accuracy. So that's kind of what it looks like. Gradient descent is somewhere here. And this method that we have is, uh, you know, it reaches much larger space of functions using the same amount of computation. So you can see that actually the fat shattering dimension of this is both a polylogarithmic, but this has some sort of exponential constant in front of it. Okay, well, how do you actually do this algorithmically? You can, there is, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but basically there is a way to do it. You take a small subsample and you can construct the pre the, the way to do it is to construct a preconditioner and you can construct eigenvectors of a, from a small subsample and then you do Nystrom extension and you use that to precondition. That turns out to be quite efficient and accurately enough to get a very large increase in speed. So of course it's an approximation, but it's a good approximation. And the nice thing is that it converges to the correct solution. So even if your approximation is not optimal, you still converge to the correct solution. So inaccuracy in constructing this only is problematic to the degree that you will not get full acceleration. Notice that we don't use any regularization in this. So basically the kind of uh, high level idea of um, EigenPro. And uh, so what we get, this are some practical results. And um, I think the interesting part about it is that if you just look, this is some standard data set of reasonable size. Um, if you look at the time which our method requires, for, for example, for this MNE, this is some sort of large version of MNE, so we took 1 million data points. It takes uh, 0.35 hours, which is about 20 minutes. Well, a little, yeah, about 20 minutes. And, um, you know, if you, for example, look at the literature, uh, comparable results, slightly worse, requires one hour on 1300 vCPUs on AWS. So it's really a very different level of computational expenditure. We are running it on a single GPU. So it's maybe a thousand times faster. Not quite a thousand times, but a lot faster. Uh, the same here, we need 25 hours to process one million data points on Timid, and we need uh, 0.8 minutes here. Well, uh, that's particularly easy data set. Uh, so yeah, you, you compare the amount of time it takes, and this is drastically faster than everything available. Um, there is actually another fast uh, kernel method from Lorenza, Razaska, Falcon, which is also quite fast, but this is even many times faster than that from last year. Uh, now, if you look at the Deep neural networks, uh, the result actually you get with deep neural networks on TIMIT, which is a speech data set, is 32.4%, and here we get 32%, and that's, you know, takes 20 minutes to get. So really, the scaling is kind of almost solved. It's not completely solved, because we still cannot do it on 300 million data points. For that, we need infrastructure. But it is solved to the degree that we can run it in 20 minutes on a million data points. It's really not a problem anymore. So better performance with far less computational budget, far, far less. Now, um, this is some very recent work, but basically we can easily match results from deep neural network on search, improving speech eligibility tasks. And I am not going to play this, but you can see this is kind of clean speech. This is noisy speech, and you can reconstruct the clean speech. It uh, can be posed as a classification or regression problem. You can do it. And it works really well. And it's kind of the results we get out of the box, more or less. It's not even particularly difficult to tune. The neural network which we are matching against, well, it's not the newest result, but it's a, it's a rather complex architecture. And we are using a single parameter. So if you basically can scale, if you can address the issue of computation, you do get good results with shallow networks with kernel methods, kernel machines. Now, uh, let me talk about the power of overfitting. Why is overfitting so good? And by good, I mean from a 
purely optimization point of view. I'm not addressing generalization here, just optimization. Well, uh, let me just very briefly remind you about stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent is something like this. You're, you're minimizing a sum of this loss function, and the loss function is computed at each data point. So it's a sum of the things. And the kind of natural idea here is, for example, it can be the square loss, is to optimize this one at a time. Okay, so that's basically what stochastic gradient descent is. You take a derivative, instead of taking the derivative for full gradient descent, you take the derivative of the sum, but we know that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, right? So why not just take one at a time? Unfortunately, um, here is a big issue. Each of these guys is only weakly related to the total sum because they somehow are very different. And what is happening is that after t step, the kind of bound that you get from bound that you get for stochastic gradient descent is one over t. For gradient descent, you get e to the minus t, right? Gradient descent converges exponentially or linearly in optimization literature. Uh, stochastic gradient descent converges at this rate, one over t, <coughs> or even worse. Uh, what is going on? So why would anybody use this when you can use that? Well, you can say, okay, gradient descent is more expensive, sure, but it's not actually any more difficult to compute. It's just more expensive per iteration. But then if this is exponential and this is not exponential, what's the rationale for using that? Well, uh, however, all the neural network architecture do use stochastic gradient descent. Well, so here is a key observation. The key observation is that if you are in this overfitted, well, uh, more precisely, interpolated <coughs> regimes, so if f of w star, where w star is the optimal solution, fits the data exactly, then uh, what you have is that all objective functions align. And the variance of your stochastic gradient descent actually decreases with the error. So what you get, you get exponential convergence of stochastic gradient descent. And that uh, has been observed in the literature, well, not in connection with interpolation in particular, and in particular, Stroman and Vershinin analyzed, uh, well, the original method goes to Kotsmart, but Stroman and Vershinin actually showed exponential convergence of that. Uh, and once you even realize this, you immediately get fast stochastic gradient descent for free, effectively. So what you have is that if you compare this to some other methods which are available to accelerate stochastic gradient descent, which are not really widely used in practice, uh, you get that stochastic gradient descent is faster. It's just faster. Under this condition. And um, the question, of course, well, so that kind of explains why stochastic gradient descent is good. It's exponential. But it doesn't explain why this is better than gradient descent itself. So why is this better than gradient descent? Or why, what's the connection to gradient descent? That just shows that it's exponential, right? But maybe gradient descent would still be a better exponential. Uh, so what we can show is the following. This is um, uh, our result with Siyuan, Ma, and Raif Basili is that, in fact, mini batch of size one has optimal uh, per computation improvement for uh, stochastic gradient descent. So if you have a much, if you're actually in the sort of classical computational model and you're just counting the number of operations, then uh, stochastic gradient descent with, with mini batch size one is optimal. That, of course, doesn't sort of, you may say, well, sure, but nobody uses this, right? Nobody uses stochastic gradient descent with mini batch size one, right? Why not? Well, the thing is, it's inefficient. Why is it inefficient? Because we're running the things on GPUs. GPUs are not sequential machines, right? GPUs are parallel machines. What is happening on GPUs is that you basically want to do some, you can kind of get a small mini batch for the same price as the mini batch of size one. It's quite the same price, but it's <coughs> close. Uh, what is happening here then is that uh, we need to analyze dependence of mini batch size 
on um, dependence on performance on the mini batch size. And we can prove the following here, is that one step of mini batch, there is some sort of optimal uh, critical point here, such that up to here, if you have, say, a mini batch of size 10, one step of mini batch of size 10 is roughly equivalent to 10 steps of mini batch of size 1. So we call this linear scaling. So it really doesn't matter. So if you have a fully parallel machine, then this will be 10 times cheaper than that. On a sequential machine, it will actually have the same cost. Now, uh, beyond this point, beyond this M star, you have saturation. And, uh, sorry. and what the saturation does, it basically you don't get any more. This is some sort of law of diminishing returns. Beyond this point, you flatten out. And at M star, you get at most one force. So one step with M star SGD is only one force is of full gradient. So if your M, uh, M star is much, much smaller than the full data size, you gain nothing by going to full gradient descent. Interestingly enough, this M star is actually almost independent on the data size itself. It's basically just eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix. And you can get a direct formula for that. It's simply trace H divided by lambda 1 of H. So if you take the Hessian at the optimal, that trace divided by lambda 1 is M star. And as you can see, uh, at least for things like kernel method, this is in roughly independent of the data size. That means that potentially you can get something like O of n improvement of SGD over the full gradient descent. And um, that actually is consistent with uh, this behavior, is consistent with linear scaling rule, something which was observed empirically in neural networks. Let me give you one example of this. Um, this is uh, a real data, this is MNIST. Uh, and we're using it for a kernel here, not for a neural net, because for kernel, much easier to analyze the eigenvalues of this matrix. So it turns out critical size is M star 8. So this is 10,000 data points. So you see that acceleration factor is about 1,000 or maybe even like 10,000 for full MNIST. And what you see is that indeed M equals 1 is optimal. This is kind of computation per epoch. So notice that epoch is a fixed number of computation in the sequential model. So what you have is uh, M equals star is optimal, and M equals 8, which is this critical value, is very close to optimal. And then when you increase the mini batch size, you get much worse performance. So it's pretty consistent with the theory. But the interesting thing is, well, if Star is 8, and you have 60,000 data points, right? You have about 10 to the 4 acceleration. And that's um, kind of almost like Moore's law, right? If you have a really big data, like 10 to the 6 data, or 10 to the 7 data points, you can get acceleration, which is basically 10 to the 6. So that, that's potentially gigantic acceleration. So we know this is happening in kernel methods. We don't know for sure this is happening in neural networks, but it sort of seems that efficiency of SGD indicated, and the fact that it actually is converging to this interpolated solutions, indicate that probably something like that is happening. Now, uh, we can, in fact, learn kernels for parallel computation. Maybe I'll skip this part, but we can modify the spectrum specifically to address this parallel computation and to optimize it for um, GPUs. Okay, so that was kind of the power that that was explaining why SGD was so efficient. But now, what about generalization, right? Where does generalization stand on it? So first, I showed you that well, this overfitted or interpolated classifier work very well. So that if you are in this regime, your SGD will work very well. But why actually? Um, why does uh, overfitting work. And here we actually kind of have very little help from theory. And here is what most theory is something like this. If you look, you know, if you take a machine learning class or if you teach a machine learning class, you probably see something like this. You have training error which goes to zero and you have a validation which goes down and then up. 
and this is kind of bias variance trade-off, and you are supposed to look for this point. So that's the theory, that's what most theory suggests. Now what is practice? Practice is like this. There is low variance and there is no bias. Bias is zero in our example, so numerically zero. What is going on? Well, there are a couple of explanations which you can suggest. One explanation is kind of a classical margin explanation, is the following. Well, suppose your data is linearly then the fact that you have a lot of data is sort of okay, because the space of classifiers, so this line, separates the data perfectly, but yes, it, it's a low VC dimension sort of thing. You can analyze it using classical results. If this is the case, then most of the theory already works. An alternative is something like this, when the data, you know, the, the, these data points are kind of crazy, and your interpolated classifier looks something like that. And we don't have much theory for this. What is going on here? Uh, which one is real data? You can test it. You can test it in two ways. First, you can do synthetic data. Second, you can do real data and label noise. Here is how we would test it, right? You take data and suppose this is linearly separable. Well, can I modify the data to make it not linearly separable? Very easily, I just flip some of those points at random. Right? This is my random point. I just toss a coin and flip some of those labels. If the first was a true explanation, then this would really break my classifiers. Well, let's see what happens. These are two data sets. Uh, this is uh, two, I'm sorry, two Gaussians in 50 dimensions. And they're linearly separable, more or less linearly separable. So I run this kernel method and I get zero error. So zero error, of course, that's what you would expect. Now I flip some of the label. 1% of the labels, you see that classifiers are now still at exactly the base optimal, so they still work perfectly. Maybe 1% is not. Sigma, extent, when do you Sigma is fixed, yeah, in this, yeah. How do you choose the same corresponding uh, Sigma here, I think, is just fixed throughout those experiments. For on the, I think it was on the original data. I'll need to check, but I think it's on the original data set without noise. But it really makes very little difference. But it's not very small. I know it's not very small. No, no, it's <coughs> not one nearest neighbor. For any other sigma, I, I mean, we don't really have theory, so it doesn't really help. But I know it's not one nearest neighbor classifier. It's very far from one nearest neighbor. No, I know, but how do you add the noise? Yeah, but I don't change sigma when I don't change noise. Choose sigma yeah. based on the noiseless data. Noiseless, yeah. And um, here I can, uh, so when I add 10% of the noise, it gets slightly worse, but it's not much worse. It's still very reasonable result. So clearly I don't have some sort of crazy explosion of the loss here. Um, I can do the same thing with, uh, you, you can look at the norms and see that the norms increases dramatically of those classifiers, but it sort of doesn't seem to affect anything. A lot of generalization bounds are based on the norm. So you see that there is no performance model complexity here. We can do it with the Gaussians, which are overlapped, so there is some sort of natural noise because of their overlap. Basically, same thing. I don't want to go over it. Uh, here is a really interesting example. We're adding large amounts of noise here. So we're adding 20%, 40%, 60%, 80% of label noise, of noise. Even at like 60% of label noise, the green is base optimal, so that's the best. The kernel does slightly worse than the optimal because this is a synthetic data set, so I actually know what the best is. The kernel does slightly, op slightly worse, but only a few percent worse. There is no, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't produce uh, nonsense. It's still very good. So clearly, even for very, very noisy data, this interpolated classifier worked remarkably well. In fact, we can prove some theoretical bounds. Maybe I'll uh, skip that. Uh, but he here are some potential explanations. Uh, one is VC dimension and Rademacher complexity type of bounds. I don't think they can work because they cannot deal with interpolated classifiers when base risk is non-zero. For zero risk, they work fine, but for non-zero risk, they um, cannot bound the gap between the empirical risk and the expected loss. Regularization type analysis, they, all of them diverge as lambda goes to zero, the regularization parameters. Uh, 
algorithmic stability has a similar issue. There is some really interesting work on classical smoothing methods like Nadaraya Watson. Most of them don't support interpolation, but there is one, there are really two interesting examples. One is just one nearest neighbor classifier, and one is something called Hilbert regression scheme. Let me uh, uh, skip this. Um, one nearest neighbor classifier is particularly interesting. It's really, um, it has zero loss, right? One nearest neighbor, you just take the nearest neighbor. But it has a normal performance guarantee. It's at worst twice the base risk, and this is a sharp bound due to cover, you know, in the 60s. And interestingly, the analysis, they're not based on margin assumptions, not based on uniform bounds, and it directly estimates generalization, doesn't try to bound the gap. So that's sort of when we're, where we're trying to look for a way forward that type of analysis. And um, let me give you an algorithm which actually is, has some of these guarantees. It interpolates the data, but it can be shown to be almost optimal. And this is joint work with Daniel So and Partamitra. Um, basically what you do, you take your data, you triangulate it. It's not a practical algorithm. You wouldn't want to triangulate data. That's a very expensive process, but let's not worry about it. Uh, you triangulate data, and then you just linearly interpolate the values. Okay, it looks something like this. If these four points are red and this is blue, I get this. This, you know, this value stays as zero, and this is one. So I have 0.5 around this point and high around this point, and then I just threshold. So this will be now blue, and the rest will be red. Very simple classification algorithm. Um, it turns out that you can show that this is nearly base optimal in high dimension. And in fact, well, this is under some margin, this is mass size uh, margin condition, but you can prove it without margin condition. You just won't get an exponential here. What you have is that basically in high dimension, this is very close to the true base risk, the risk of that classifier given sufficient amount of data. So it's like one nearest neighbor, but except of a factor of two here, I have something like one plus one over two to the D. So this is very tight, at least when dimension is high enough and you have enough data. And interestingly, have a blessing of dimensionality that this algorithm actually becomes better as you have more dimensions. So that's an unusual property of this algorithm. So that may be something which gives a way forward on this algorithm. So how do you view interpolation? Maybe something like that is happening. So let me now uh, kind of summarize a couple of slides. Um, first, I think clearly this is kind of the take-home message. Uh, overfitting allows for very efficient optimization by stochastic gradient descent. Generalization, which we don't fully understand why that happens. And it's not a trivial <coughs> issue to actually overfit the data. When you have a lot of data solving the systems or doing this optimization, really requires thinking about what kind of algorithms are involved and how to deal with that. And the question uh, from a practical point of view, can we actually scale those kernels? Because kernels we understand much better than we understand deep networks. Now, uh, Kind of, you can maybe think a part of deep learning, you can maybe understand it in this form. So first, you have this over-parameterization, which naturally leads to interpolation. And surprisingly, that generalizes well. But once you believe that this generalizes well, this maps onto fast results in fast SGD. And fast SGD sort of map naturally to GPUs, because that's really like almost like designed. SGD really is designed for GPUs in some sense. So GPU is designed for SGD, I don't know. I mean, it was developed independently, but it's an extremely good match. So I think there is a lot of serendipity in that, how the things worked together. And a lot of sort of surprising aspects of that. There is one aspect of deep learning which I didn't talk at all about, is convolutional structure. I think that's a really important aspect which are kind of orthogonal to what to those optimization and generalization aspects of that. And so that's one. And um, finally, I think, I, think we, I think it's really a fundamental question of high dimensional inference. Why do those classifiers 
generalized. It has been observed for deep neural networks. We are now observing it for kernel machines. Random forest was observed maybe you know, 15 or 20 years ago for other boost. It goes back to 95. People said that other boost doesn't uh, overfit. And clearly, the margin explanations are not the complete story there. And uh, I think it's actually time to revisit high dimensional statistics, maybe get some new understanding of these problems. Thank you. I'll stop here.